What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us our, your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes and Spotify. Also, Instagram at talklouder underscore podcast. And our website, talklouderpodcast.com. I'm Metal Dave, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And today's guest is Rocky Lamonde, who is the bass player for a band called the Borstal Boys. If that name sounds familiar... You are correct. They stole their name from a Faces song, so that gives you some inclination of what his band sounds like, what his influences are. We find out he's also got uh, other influences uh, beyond the Faces, the Stones, etc. Um, he's a guy out of Pittsburgh, and he's been in the Pittsburgh music scene for decades. Uh, I think he owns a recording studio. He's doing all kinds of things to further the music scene in Pittsburgh and the surrounding area. And uh, he's sharing some stories with us today and uh, just kind of giving us the lowdown on what's been going on in his scene in Pittsburgh. He's all about sort of um, advocacy and raising awareness for Good, uh, yeah. for his scene as well as... Um, when the pandemic hit and the clubs and venues and bars started, uh, you know, live music venues were shutting down because they just couldn't keep the doors open. Uh, he was uh, working with people who were trying to fight back and, you know, he was working with Save Our Stages, which is an organization that, that uh, and, you know, that helped pass a bill through Congress where there would be relief fundage going to uh, live music venues to try to stay afloat during the, the downtime. Yeah. Um, that bill did pass. Uh, Rocky was one uh, in his area who was uh, basically beating the drum for that, flying the flag, and still is trying to raise awareness for Pittsburgh, uh, you know, music scene. It doesn't matter what kind of music. He just... Uh, we find out that he's just, he's a rocker. He loves swagger. He loves, uh, he loves old kiss. He loves the stones. He thinks Keith Richards is the greatest, uh, guitar player. He thinks Rod Stewart is the greatest singer. Yeah. Um, this, this guy was super, super interesting and a really cool, just hang out. I, I, I like the idea of talk louder, just finding, uh, or being introduced to by Paul Unger again, uh, yeah. my, our, our friend, Paul Unger is, who's, uh, also beating the drum and helping, uh, musicians be heard, um, in his own wonderful way for many, many years. Um, y you know, it was really cool to meet someone and bring them into the talk louder, uh, family who just cares about music and yeah. wants to talk about it and wants to tell you about it and help uh, his band as well as any, maybe even more so, his community of, of musicians um, be able to eat, be able to have fries with that hamburger, be able to feed the kids, yeah. be able to yeah. have, make this a, a well-to-do enough career um, and just uh, being an artist and, and do what they're on the planet to do, and that is create. Um, yeah. It was a great episode. It was a great hang, and uh, I think that you'll really like it. Dave, do you you have anything else to say before you take us in? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, I mean, he's been in the into the music scene in Pittsburgh for so long, he actually started playing bars when he was 16 years old. Right. So he is yeah. deeply, deeply, deeply rooted in the Pittsburgh uh, music scene. And uh, Again, his uh, current project, he's got a band called the Borstal Boys. They have a new album out called Crumbs. Uh, we talk about that. Uh, if you're into anything that you've heard so far, Faces, Stones, Motown, uh, Springsteen, Jay Giles Band, Southside Johnny and the Jukes, that kind of stuff, Barroom, Swagger, Boogie, Rock and Roll, this guy's your man. So we're real happy to have him on the show today. Rocky Lamonde on the Talk Louder podcast. So, Rocky, why don't you give us a quick uh, snapshot of uh, of who you are? Tell tell our audience who you are, what you do. Kind of give us a little uh, the short version of your your history and what it is you do in the world of rock and roll. Well, I guess uh, the short version of my history is I've been a musician. Um, my whole life, uh, 
through high school, I went to a performing arts high school in Pittsburgh and um, started playing in rock and roll bands since the early 90s. Um, played with a bunch of good uh, local blues guys and rock and roll guys in the city. Um, just played music my whole life. And as I got older, I, different bands I was in, and then I started writing a lot. And um, that's really what I focus on now is writing and producing and things like that. So I guess that's the short version of what I do. Yeah, oh, that's good. So you've been in Pittsburgh the whole time? Yes, sir. All right. So yeah, and I like a you're like a an advocate. You're like a um you know, you're 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 deeply rooted in your scene and uh sort you dude, when are you gonna run for mayor? We need a rock and roll mayor. <laughs> no, man, no politics for me. Politics. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. You're you're fighting for the you're you're in it for real if you've been in the area your whole life. Um Yes, I, I could. It's a similar story for me um, being, you know, from from here in Austin. When I got here from South Texas, it was like I, that's when my career started. So uh, oh, I've been flying oh, that, that flag for a, it, it's the same. So we are yeah. kindred spirits in that way. I think that, um, you know, w when you when you start writing your first songs and you and then you. Uh, you had, you've already adapted to since you're a, a, a local, but but uh, have a, you know probably a, a pretty far reach. Um, you know, you become an advocate for your city, and a uh, you you're waving the flag. So, tell us a little. Let's jump forward to um, when COVID hit. You started a project as uh, Save Our Stages uh, project. Tell us a little bit about that, because I I. Per, pretend I don't know anything about it. Okay. It was, uh, 2020, uh, toward the end of 2020, I would say October of 2020. Um, we were already into the pandemic there for almost a year. Um, a friend of mine wrote a song SOS 2020 and he appraised on the same label as I am on the vault records. And, um, he asked the owner of the vault records if he would, if he'd be interested in putting this song out for, the purpose of raising awareness and money for the SOS, the Neva national campaign, save our stages. So um, he asked me to produce the song. So when I jumped in, I produced the song, you know, rearranged certain things in the song, got that all together. But then I also got a lot of musicians to, to jump in on it as well. So um, Eric did as well. Eric Rogers, the guy who wrote the song and I produced it and it was done at the vault. And we, we brought in, I bet you, at least 70 musicians. I'm not really sure the exact number, but it's definitely between 60 and 80. So was, this a, was this a digital or a streaming sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, money-making, you know, uh, type of a charity to, to, the, to the national program, Save Our Stages? Yes, it, was, it wasn't a streaming. It was uh, we recorded a song and we put it out. We got a bunch of press around town. So it was more to raise awareness because I'm in Pittsburgh. It's not a Nashville thing or, or Memphis or anything like that where it's a, a gigantic scene or anything. But uh, we knew that we weren't going to raise a ton of money that was actually going to affect anything because they, all these clubs are closing down. They need, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. It was more to raise awareness. We were on all the local stations, okay. 2, 4, and 11. They, you know, said, okay, this is why we're doing it. So it was to get people to donate to, to the national campaign and also to get the politicians' awareness that we need that bill passed that finally did pass a while after that or whatever. But uh, we, yeah, we got all kinds was, of Luckily, there was all kinds of uh, – this is sort of a blanketed uh, a national uh, thing comment here – is that that was happening everywhere. Yeah, so, well, you know, venues were closing down and they had to get creative. You know, like venues that never sold a peanut butter and jelly sandwich all of a sudden started making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches just so they could get the right license as a restaurant so yeah. they could stay open. Yeah. yeah, you had to sit down at a table as long as you were eating. So there was clubs we were playing during that time that, you know, you would, you would order an appetizer. You weren't allowed to stand up and walk around. And we were playing. It was kind of strange to play that way because, you know, usually people were up standing up in front of the stage or whatever, but uh, people were just sitting down. And, 
you didn't have to wear a mask and you could be in the place as long as you were eating. So as long as you ordered one appetizer and you left it on your table and the girl didn't, the waitress or waiter didn't take away that plate, you were fine and you could just stay there. And that's kind of how we, we went about it because we played straight through the whole pandemic, really. Uh, my band did anyhow. Maybe the first six months we didn't. But then after they yeah. kind of let like, you know, 40 people in or half capacity or anything like that, we played, you know, as much as we could, you know. Yeah. Tell 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 people who your band is and tell us a little bit about your band. Uh, my band is called the Borsta Boys and uh, we're a rock and roll band. Um, heavily influenced. My, one of my favorite bands of all time, actually my favorite band of all time is The Faces. Um, nice. So we're influenced by The Faces, Stones, you know, all that kind of stuff, regular rock and roll. And um, that's where we got our name from, the Borsta Boys is a, is a Faces blues. song. British That's blues right. style. Yeah. The band before that was Torn and Frayed, which is, you know, Exile on Main Street. So um, that's that's our influence, and that's the new band, the, the band I'm in right now that I've been doing a lot of writing with. And so I, I think I read somewhere that you've been playing around the bars in, in the Pittsburgh area since the age of 16. Um, yes. When you're in a bar playing at the age of 16, what are some of the lessons learned? What, what, what's some of the most valuable lessons learned and what are some of the pitfalls that you uh, learned to sidestep at such a young age? Um, I, I, at 16, I don't think I really was learning much. I was just going out and having a good time playing music. <laughs> uh, I didn't really start really learning until later on, you know, in my thirties and stuff. My first, the band I was in that did really well, Torn and Frayed in the early nineties. Um, I was like 20. I was just playing and enjoying myself playing and I got better as a player, but um, I wasn't really, I was, I was doing all the booking. So I was learning that part of it. So I learned how to book, how to get in contact with people, how to uh, set up shows, how to talk with promoters and things like that. So I guess that's what I learned as a, at a young age going that actually helped me now where I am, you know, cause I know all those people and I got those relationships, I guess, through those early years. Yeah. You're, you're the tree shaker now. I guess, I guess so. I mean, uh, the tree man. <laughs> yeah. Try well, anyhow. well, you know, you, it, to, to, you know, it's, I feel like learning how to be cordial and make a phone call, a cold call to a club or a talent buyer and, and just in a few words or one conversation, you know, five minutes, let's just give it that and be able to get a gig that doesn't, uh, you know, where you're not having to pay to play. That's an, that's an art form in its own. And a lot of young people can't, can't even fathom that idea. You know, Hey man, I got a band. Will you give me some money? You know, that, that's not going to work. That, that doesn't work. That's not how it goes. So back yeah. to when you were 16, um, I don't even remember 16. Let's hope you do. But I know this, that when I was 16, they weren't going to let me in a, a proper uh, venue or a, I'm sorry, a proper, like a bar. You say you were playing in a bar when you were 16? Yes, I was playing the Decade when I was 16. And the Decade is a huge club. Like the Police played there, the Ramones played there, Bruce Springsteen played there. So um, it's your cool, legendary, it's your cool, legendary Pittsburgh club. It's, it's the number yeah. one bar. Yes, yeah. it was. Wow. That's where all the major acts came through. And it wasn't even a big place like you that would hold like six, 700 people. It was a place that held like 200 and you were up against each other if there was 200 people in the club right and at the age of 16 playing there and then i would also go see shows and i knew the escape route there's like an escape route out of it you know what i mean you go through <laughs> yeah. the, you out the back door up and there's apartments upstairs and you go through that door and you head out to the street so i was well, informed which way to go if anything started people, happening. people freak out when they walk into cbgb's and go this is cbgb's and that i can touch the walls just by holding your arms out you know? but you probably wouldn't want to no you yeah. wouldn't want to touch the walls um so yeah. you know not to not to go where i usually go but just just in re to relate um a little bit is when i was you know 16 even 17 um i wouldn't i couldn't they wouldn't let wouldn't let me uh be in a venue that or or a bar that you know a rock bar uh, that had a stage and a pa and lighting and there you know serve alcohol if you will at that age 
I feel in my area, mainly I feel like because of the kind of music that I played, you know, which is heavy metal, it was thrash metal. So they weren't going to, you know, it's like, God, get out of here, kids. Y'all are too loud and too fast. And we want people dancing and drinking and you can't do that because yeah, you're yeah. a kid. So how are, how are you, how did you get that sort of like uh, snuck in, if you will, uh, past all that? Were you playing bluesy stuff and groovy stuff when you, at that age or? Well, at that age, I wasn't. I was playing cover tunes. It was my first band. It was a band called Strutter, which is after a Kiss oh, song. Yeah. We were doing yeah. Kansas. Kansas. You just became our best. You just became our best new friend. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, that's what. <laughs> growing up, that's what I, I was born in '72. I was a Kiss fan when I was eight years old. I, you know, the, every single Kiss album growing up. So I grew up with that music. So I yeah. later on got the stones and faces thing going. So okay. as a child, I grew up with more Kansas, Boston, like as a bass player, the reason why I started playing bass is listening to Boston bass lines. Oh yeah. And then I found out afterwards, the main guy in Boston, I forget his name right now, but, uh, the singer, the guitar oh. player. Oh, the guitar Tom player, Schultz. Tom Schultz. Tom Schultz. I found out recently a week or two ago, some Facebook post that he was the one who played all the bass lines on the album. Oh, there you go. I was just going to ask you. I was just going to ask you if you knew the bass player of Boston. I actually know. That's what we were talking earlier. Uh, me is and it, Jay. Is it, is it Barry Goudreau? I'm not sure. Uh. Ah. <laughs> you guys don't know that because we were talking earlier, and I was telling Jason how he knows. When I watch your shows, you guys know all the guys' names and what's going on in the scene and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So I was I was very impressed with that. But I didn't know that that he was the bass player. I didn't know that he played the bass lines in Boston. And that's what Tom, that's what, yeah. really as a bass player, what I thought his bass lines were amazing. So well, interesting enough, it's a lot of people don't realize that Paul Stanley played bass on some KISS songs in the studio too. Yeah. Yeah. It, it he makes, actually uh, he played the bass on uh I was made for loving you, I believe. Oh wow! Yeah, that was disco era there. Yeah, yeah. seventy nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, well. So when you're not to harp on your your young sixteen year old <laughs> kiss freak self, if you're playing cover songs, uh, how did someone invite you to come play? You know this famous bar. You had to work your way in back then. So okay. Was there old? Was there did? Was anyone else in your band of drinking age, and you were the young buck? Yes, everybody was around twenty to twenty-two years old when I was sixteen. So in, everybody in the drinking I age, with my the drinking. I'm, I'm sorry, the drinking age back then probably would have been eighteen or nineteen. Always been twenty-one. Oh, it was always twenty-one in Texas. It was 18, then it was 19, and then it was 21. So my uh, age, I'm. So I'm, you're regressing. I'm the older, right. I'm the old of the, I'm the older gent between the three of us. So I was chasing that. I, I was like, when I was 18, they changed it to 19. When I was 19, they changed it to 21. So I had a friend who turned 19 the day they changed it to 21. Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> I can Talking relate. About bad timing. So, so how did you go, Rocky? How did you go from Kiss to the Faces? What was it about the Faces that made you such a fan? I started playing with some guys in the band called Torn and Frayed, and they were heavily influenced by the Stones and the Faces. Um, the guitar player, Vinny Q, which is in my band right now, we've been playing together since 1990, and he's as close as you can get to uh, Keith Richards in a human being. Um, he the way he plays, everything about the way he plays guitar is uh, very Keith Richards-like. Um, I guess just being exposed to them and then me finding out and then hearing the faces and things like that. Now, I'm a Faces fan. I'm not really a small Faces fan, so I don't know if there's a dis distinction there of, uh, you know, I'm a Rod Stewart is the greatest rock and roll singer of all time in my eyes. There will be, wow. never be a better rock and roll singer than Rod Stewart. Um and just by watching like some faces concerts and seeing them on stage and how they acted together in the music and how it was very simple and how you could play an open tuning like that. And it just let those uh, chords ring out and, and more about the songs really attracted me to the, to the faces and to the stones and things like that. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah, they had like a, they kind of had like this boozy brotherhood, you know, you, you they, just, they had, I think the word swagger was invented around bands like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I mean, they had it, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us about your album, uh, Borstel Boys. The album is called Crumbs. Um, I was listening to it uh, earlier today. And uh, the standout tracks for me are, are Take the Wheel and Rust Belt. I really like the lyrics on Rust Belt where it throws in the ne'er-do-well. <laughs> the, yes. it, so tell me, are you the primary songwriter um, in your band or do you prefer to collaborate? How does it come about? Um, so the first album is mainly all my songs. Um, there's one tune that's Vinny's. Me and Vinny do most of the writing. Um, as this band has gone on, it, it's turning into more of a, a process where everybody contributes. Um, you can see that in Crumbs. And in the next album, it, it's even more clear or evident that uh, that everybody is putting their own spin on, spin on the songs. Um, me and Vinny pretty much write most of the tunes. The one tune that you like, Rust Belt, actually, is a friend of mine. Um, uh, Brett Staggs wrote that song, and he was in the band for a little bit. Uh, he helped us out when we played. We did that show with Alice Cooper's band, and uh, he filled in for us of just singing. And uh, I, I like him as a songwriter, so we do a couple of his songs as well. Um, but he did write. That's the only song out of those two albums that you heard that uh, that was written by somebody else was Rust Belt. Um, I usually come up with a hook in my head, and I and then I write everything around that. Any tune that I write, usually I write a chorus, and then I just write the rest of the song around the chorus. Does it's Mike hard, hard does uh, does Mark write the lyrics? Yes, he does. Some some of the words are mine. I, I bet probably half the tunes that I wrote on there are, are my lyrics, and then the other half is I'll bring it in, and I might have a hook, or he'll start just singing while we're jamming a song, and I'll be like, "That's that's the hook right there. We got to make that the chorus." And then he 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 brings in lyrics, and we go through it together, and we you know, we, we, uh, figure out where, what we're going to land on or whatever, but he, he, and on that crumbs album, like I said, more and more, they're his lyrics. Yeah. And yeah. on the next album, almost all of them are his lyrics, but then a song like 21 grams is all mine. Take the wheel that you said that one, that's all my lyrics as well, but there's other tunes on there. I don't, I don't know off, my, off the side of my, off the top of my head right now, but that he contributed the lyrics to. So for, for people that may not be familiar with your band, uh, I'm listening to it and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I hear, obviously I hear the faces and the stones and I hear, I actually hear some Motown in there. Um, uh, some Motown flavor. Uh, I kind of get the, 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 the Jersey kind of bar room, you know, Bruce Springsteen, Southside Johnny kind of deal. I, I hear some Jay Giles band. Am I on the mark? Yes, you are. Jay Giles is, uh, is, is one of my favorite bands as well. Um, and I don't know what it is. I'm a rock and roll guy, but every once in a while, it seems like on each of those albums, there's one tune that I would write that ends up sounding like a Motown song. And I, I'm not even trying to do it, but for some reason it just comes out that way. And, um, so I wouldn't even know how to tell you how I'm writing that. Uh, it's just something that came to my head and I liked it. And it has that Motown flavor, you know, and um, which is cool with me. And a lot of people also said that they that we sound like a, like a Springsteen yeah. as, as well. And uh, those are all compliments to me, you know. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, yeah. I get the I get the blue collar vibe, you know. There, you're. I'm sure you're very familiar with Jesse Mallon. Uh, he kind of reminds me of that sort of thing where. Somebody that, you know, the, the music just sort of paints a picture and that picture is typically something that, you know, the average Joe can relate to because it's very working class. It's very down at the corner bar kind of deal. Yeah. And yeah. I, I hear a lot of that in, in, in your band. Well, and I mean, that is a compliment too. Yeah, <laughs> my songs, I, I bet you, if you went through and you listened to it, my songs are just straightforward rock and roll tunes that have fun. My lyrics are nothing that, that you're going to say, wow, that's a great song, a lyricist, you know what I mean? It's not going to be that way, you know what I mean? But Mark, when he writes his words, they're more, you know, you know, we the people, and you know, it, it, he's actually telling a story, and he's more 
into a lyricist kind of thing like that. Mine is basically I take the wheel, let's go, let's go out, you know, that kind of thing. I rock and roll, let's go drink, party, whatever, you know, but that's more in, in the terms of where when I write, you know. Yeah. That's your yeah. that's your Paul Stanley Gene Simmons lyric you got going on there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. A couple of people have said that as well. Yeah. So so you know when you, you if some of your stuff comes off as uh sounding or influenced by by Motown spirit, I feel like, you know, Tina Turner, um I feel like well not not limit but not limited to, but artists like that. She is rock and roll. She's the epitome of rock and roll. Motown is rock and roll. It's Detroit rock and roll. Um, Motown influenced your influencers. Yeah. So you're in the right realm. You're in the right place. Motown influenced Springsteen. Motown influenced the Stones, the Faces. Yeah. I mean... Uh, other than other than maybe huge horn sections and places and Motown stuff, I, f I feel like a stripped down version of maybe Motown is where uh, other than the Stones, because the Stones did it all. They had horns and, you know, anyway, but the point is sharp and yeah. you're you're right there with uh, uh, the open tunings makes me feel like um you know in your influences i don't know what tunings you like to use or if that is a big part of where you guys start when you write um the open tunings um come from in my in my opinion like a a, a folk direction like a from, from like a folk music uh kind of thing because there's there's slide and there's finger picking and there's strange chords or even strange tunings, you know, I guess you could just call it, um, and harmonicas and things, you know, like a Dylan or, or something, you know, but yes. that I feel like is also, a, a a part of, of maybe where you guys are coming from. Maybe, maybe not directly to, you know, the ingredients I just mentioned, you know, harmonicas and, and horns, but, uh, I know you're not afraid of that. Does, we that, have, sound, we does that sound horns. right? We have horns on that album. Yeah. Uh, we got horns on two or three of those songs. On that album, we also collaborated with a, a, a guy named Gallo around town here. He's a local rapper. And there's a tune on there called Walking Away. And we kind of, um, everybody laughed at me because it was, it was one riff over and over again. And they would laugh at me in the studio. They'd say, how's that riff go again? Because it was the same thing over and over again. So they were just kind of getting, but it turned out to be a really cool, riff and we everything was it was the verse and the chorus and everything was all the same uh musically as but long as it as long as you, it, as long as you can put a hook on it that's a that 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 worm right. will, that worm will catch a fish you know i always say i always say if i can't hum it when the song's over it really ain't worth anything i call it a filler sure. i mean you have to be able when a song is over if you can't hum the chorus or or catchy part to that song you, to me, you didn't really accomplish anything. I think it's a good challenge for a songwriter to, uh, you know, it's a great challenge for a writer to have, if you can have one riff and just change the melody, uh, it, you know, and use one, one different vocal melody or, or keys melody or what, whatever, whatever. It could be a kazoo melody. It doesn't matter. But if you have a melody that fits a verse and a melody that fits a chorus and a different, even a different one that fits, a, it's all about scale and st and your starting note within the ingredients of the scale. As long as the ingredients of the scale that that one F and riff is being played in, you can write a song. So pop, I'm t literally just <laughs> described how pop music is written. You yeah. know, there's Lady Gaga songs and, and, and you know, Billie Eilish songs. It's one riff, but it's the spaces between. They'll play one riff for four bars, and then there's a drum drop, you know, and then they're going with drums and maybe one note on the keyboard. Guess yep. what's coming back? Same riff. So it's how you write your song maps and what you're doing in the spaces in between, the melodies in between. That make it doesn't matter if it's one note for three and a half minutes if you're if that, changing if your, 
Yeah. My favorite yeah. guitar players are guitar players who can play a solo and kill me with like three, four notes. Yeah. Rather than a hundred, you know. So that I mean, that's just my style. If I could see one guy over there and he goes, he's playing in blues and he gives me he half the solo is three notes and then the other half is one note, but how he plays that one note is really what tells me when a guy is really on top of his instrument, when he can make one note sing to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Shanker brothers, uh, Ace Freely. Yeah. Ace uh, Freely. uh, Angus Young. Every solo solo Ace Freely played. If you put the album on, I'll sing every solo to you. Yeah. Yeah. Which is wonderful. That's a, that's a, that's a lot of magic to, you know, that's the less is more kind of thing. Uh, Yeah. I, 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 the idea of, uh, of Ace writing a guitar solo after, after, you know, reading interviews and hearing him talk about how he's basically confessing that he's just making shit up, that he's not, he doesn't think he's a very good guitar player. I mean, I think he's fairly sloppy, but you know what? That's part of the swagger. That's part of the. Yeah, yeah, that's part of the thing that he brought to it is making it sexy and a little slippery and kind of, you know, but he, he didn't even realize that that's what he was doing to yeah. the song, to the solo. Um, he's just filling up, uh, you know, the parts given by Gene and Paul, you know, in, in that scenario, you know. I mean, I find that hard to believe myself that, that he didn't know what he was writing there. I mean, he might've just did it off the cuff, but after he listened back to it, I'm sure he knew that he knew because he played it every night that if he didn't play some of those solos the same way that he recorded them, people would, he, he people would notice it because right. they're written, they're written like a melody. Yeah. So, if you didn't play it, everybody at the gig would be like, wow, he, he's not playing those the same solos. So you have to know that in your head, you know, anyhow, is what I would think about that. Well, it's Jimmy right. Page and Chuck Berry. That's kind yeah. of where he wanted to be. He lo- I know he loves Jeff Beck, but he doesn't play like Jeff Beck. No, not um, at all. He, he loves the Stones, though. So yeah. that yeah. makes a lot of sense. But you know Ace and and I'm the bi- I'm as big an Ace fan as anybody in this room right now. But you know Ace plays like three licks. Yep. <laughs> and yeah. my favorite one that he plays is. Yeah. They all count exactly. That's only one note, man. If you can make one note last a couple bars. And people love that. You you've done your job. Is, is the other I'm one that he plays is There's two of them. I opened up for Ace Freely at the Palace Theater in Greensburg, um, and uh, so we went up on stage and, and we played. And beforehand, you know, was you know you're not allowed to touch none of Ace of stuff, obviously, and. We go up to play and they're like, you know, you only got like 35 minutes. We're like, yeah, okay. So we start playing and we're 35 minutes in. We had it all figured out what the last song we wanted the last song to be. Crash, look over and the dude's like, keep going. <laughs> we're like, Ace isn't here yet. <laughs> you know, he was supposed to be here two hours <laughs> earlier to sign autographs and he isn't even in the building. He was so on Ace third, time. Our 35 minute set went on for an hour and a half. Oh, were so, you ready? Did you have the material? Yeah, we had the material because okay. uh, all my bands are. Uh, it seems anymore the bands can't play a whole night. But when I was raised, like you said, sixteen playing in bars, uh, early nineties. You didn't play with three bands a night. You went into a bar, you were yourself, and you played three sets. You know, yeah, what I mean? right. like from ten in the, ten at night till two in the morning. Yeah, that and was very uh, very had, common. We had the material. But when you when someone says you're opening up for Ace Freely and there's thousands of people in front of you, you put your best eight songs together <laughs> and you want to close with a certain song. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you took your best eight songs you already played, and now you got to play for another hour and ten minutes because Ace is <laughs> in the building. It ends up being <laughs> it ends up being what's left. You know what I mean? But we did we did good and stuff. But it was a funny story, you know. Yeah. yeah well, it's yeah. it's also a thankless job too. Yeah. You know, I, and, and and you kind of like uh, 
it's kind of like whoever opens for Kiss usually is not. And that's Kiss, not Ace. I don't know if it sta stands, but as a Kiss fan, it's like Kiss doesn't need an opening band. Why yeah. am I seeing this band open for Kiss? You know, I mean, unless it was someone who I I like as well as Kiss, but yeah, they brought on to the tour. Like, okay, get off the stage so I can see Kiss. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. <laughs> so, so with Ace Freely, if uh, if you, as long as you didn't, you know, people didn't start shouting back, it's like. Hey, uh, you're the opening band. Remember why are you? Why is your set longer than Aces? And you know, let me ask you this, Rocky. Did you have to play any cover tunes to fill it up, or we might have played one or two out of the, out of the next hour? Totally allowed. I I yeah. I will allow it. Yeah. I would it, allow it. it. Always We've allowed. Been all, I've always been an original band, so. Yeah. Um, any band that I'm in, like even Force the Boys, right now, we're up to about forty originals. Um, we have another album that's that's done that's getting mixed right now um for for our third that'll be our third album um and we have tunes that we don't we're not going to record you know they're just they're all right but they 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 were never good enough to actually record so we have a couple of those as well you know um so we have around 40 tunes so we could always play longer if we wanted and i've always been in bands that, that were that way you know usually when when there's songs that are good enough to be on the record and this is just a personal uh aspect of something you said we try to rehearse them or even attempt to play them live and they just blow up in our face like oh man that's too hard to play live <laughs> because i feel like in a in situations where you're in rehearsal you can you can you can rehearse it you can drill it you can practice it right you know and then you get it and you get to the gig and it just uh, it for whatever reason some songs don't go over well live or you you fuck them up and it's like damn it you know what i mean so it 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 can and this is just personal it can change the way that you write songs so that you have songs that work well with your live show yeah does that make sense to you it does. I mean, yeah. I, I do it both ways. Like it's opposite for me. I'll, I'll write a tune and I like it live. Like that walking away song that I was telling you about from, from the crumbs album. Mm -hmm. uh, after I recorded it, every time I play it live now, it's like, uh, because we threw all kind of horns on it. There's all kind of parts on it that we can't do live. We can still do it. And it's a stripped down version of it. It's cool. But without those horn parts and all these other parts that I threw on it in the studio, it's it's hard to to capture that live now unless we've yeah. done a couple of shows where I'll hire a horn section to come up and they'll play with us and we'll and it'll be really cool. But uh, I, I don't have the uh, I wish I had a horn section that was with the band all the time. Or mm -hmm. something. Wow, that would, that would make it make it fun and a, a, a bit more uh, not literal but electric. You know, livens that tune up a lot. For wakes sure. it up yeah so i would you know it's it turns into you know you wonder if your audience no, realizes that you don't like to play that song because it's missing so much shit uh no. oh hey man you you didn't play walking away this time and you you're like gritting your teeth going yeah it's kind of you know, you're making this kind of grimacing face and they're asking, it's my favorite song. How come you don't do it live? And do they really know why or understand, uh, you know, well, we need horns and it just, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not very good without the full production. That fan who is crying about it because it's their favorite song. Yeah. You that's a bummer for the artist to hear if somebody go, Oh man, you didn't play, you know, song I'll X. I'll play it for him. Yeah. I was going to say, you, then, you just, then you just grin and bear it and knock it out for that person. Or, yeah. or, or, or you, or, the, or you might realize that that person is speaking for many people and you go, you know, you have to make this adjustment in your head going, okay, I got to stop being so prejudiced about this song in my own mind. There's people that want to hear it, even if it's a stripped down version and Hey, we're playing live anyway. So we'll just, we'll just rock it out and make these people happy and have some fun with it. I understand that. I understand that side of it as well, but it's an interesting subject that we've sort of, uh, 
land it on here for just a minute because if someone will tell me like in an email or in a some kind of chat room or 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 just request it where when they have a chance to make a request which i don't really take requests ever at all <laughs> uh because i'm not a jukebox you know um the uh the the thing is is it's usually a song that we've never played live. How come y'all don't play this song, man? That's my favorite song. How come y'all don't play that? It's like you're one person that's saying you're one person that that's their favorite song. And it reverts back to here's the reason why we don't play it. It's like the band can't, we suck. We can't play that song because we suck at it. They don't understand that. And I'm not at liberty to just tell them right to their face. Because we can't, because we suck playing that song. We've tried, we rehearse it, and we're terrible at that song. We learned it, we, we wrote it, we learned it, we recorded it, we forgot it, and I'm glad that you love it, but sorry. It ties yeah, into one of the... What you said earlier, I've had the same exact conversation. Where I'm you're sure. Like, right, why don't you play that song? And my answer was exactly what you said. Well, after I recorded it, it had all these horns parts in it. And now, now when I play it live, it's kind of like not there for me. You know what I mean? And it wasn't that way before I went into the studio. It was perfectly fine, stripped down with guitars and bass and just the way we did it. And then after I went to the studio and we put all these other things on top of it, now it's kind of a, it's just in my own head, a kind of a letdown. And I'll, and I explain that to people when they ask me something yeah. like that. Yeah. The same thing yeah. that you said earlier, I've had yeah. that conversation multiple times. With people. You put all, you went in the studio, put all the icing on the cake, and now you can't eat the cake without the icing. It's dry now, man. It's dry. Yeah. Well, yeah. sometimes it's different. All of the elements will be there on stage, but you know, the you know the the reason why we can't play it is not production we're missing horns or we're missing whatever it is nothing will be missing it just goes pure brutal honesty yeah we we're terrible at it we would that that's so much work for us to learn relearn that song it's like what song are you talking about really we have a song called that Oh shit, we do have a song called, you know, the, it's a song that's never been played live. That's where I'm kind of coming from. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a uh, it's dangerous because you you want to your fans to be right all the time. You want them, wow, that is a good song. Wow, we need to like pull our britches up and be a good better band and pl be able to play that song. Sure, or maybe not. You know, some of the greatest songs that I feel like we as writers will ever write are the chances of them playing being played live are minimal like i've had major label money have you know me and a, a, another bandmate fly a thousand miles to get in a room with a with writers and write a song that's supposed to be the single or some shit, you know, yeah. and then we're all back on the plane. I'm looking at my guys and we're going, that song is terrible. We're never going to play that live. And the label spent all this <laughs> jackass money for us to fucking do. Dude, it's happened. It's crazy. I've written songs with um, Taylor Rhodes, who ironically wrote Centerfold, Jay Giles band. Okay. Uh, he's a Nashville hey, guy. Never used any of the song. We wrote two songs. Centerfold. Jay Giles hates Centerfold. <laughs> I love Centerfold. I do too. When I was young, it was one of my favorite tunes. Now, Jay Giles is a blues guy. He he probably took that. In. He hated playing that. Every time he ever played Centerfold, he hated. Yeah, I, right. I have some interviews with him saying. Well, that it's not. Center. It's not a blues song. No, no, and that's a song that they it's, wrote for him to be famous on MTV. It's a pop right. song. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's oh yeah. Mickey, you're so fine kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is if you think about the oh Mickey, I notice how I stop singing because we do not own the rights to that music. No, so uh, oh so hey Mickey or whatever that song is, the Tony Basil song. If you think about it, and I love Rem, Run DMC, but it's tricky is hey Mickey. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to start rapping it's tricky <laughs> by Run DMC but hey Mickey and it's tricky they're the same fucking song y'all we got to uh listen to think about the melody one's faster I mean hey Mickey's actually faster than it's tricky but yeah. 
those rhyme schemes, they go right together. And why no one's done a mashup of that, I have no idea. Because it's well, the same know, fucking song. We're all writing the same song when it comes down to it. Everything's been written. Every chord change. Every yeah, I say, I say thank you. I say thank you, Angus Young, and thank you, Gene and Paul, on a Chuck daily Berry. basis. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Chuck Berry. Yeah. Yes. Thank so, you. Well, that's better. That's that's that should be a uh, a bumper sticker. <laughs> thank you, Chuck Berry. So. so, Rocky, I wanted to ask you about uh, Pittsburgh because that's your scene, and you may you alluded to something earlier in this conversation where you said that. Um, you know, Pittsburgh obviously isn't, uh, it's not Nashville, it's not LA, it's not New York, it's not Chicago, it's not Detroit when it comes to music. See, it's not Austin. Um, but I, I was doing a little research on Pittsburgh and I was kind of surprised at some of the names that popped out. Donnie Iris. Um, I thought that was a trip. I didn't know Donnie Iris was from Pittsburgh. And uh, a band that I'm familiar with, uh, the Cynics, um, some friends of mine from San Antonio called the Sons of Hercules played, they're big fans of the Cynics and they played some shows together. So I got to know the Cynics through them. And then, um, also Rusted Root, who I saw, uh, on tour opening for Page and Plant when they did their reunion. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Rusted Root had a moment where they sold a gazillion records in a, in a short period of time. And I think you have a connection to that band. Is that, is that right? The connection I have with that band is Patrick Norman, who was the bass player for Rusted Root. Um, he, he's also the co-writer of the big tune that they have on Disney, the Send Me On Your Way tune. And uh, so he ended up, I was friends with him for years. I'm friends with his wife. Um, he wasn't playing at the time. Rusted Root wasn't together. They're still not together. They're, just, they're doing this thing called Uprooted, which is the main guy, Michael Kubicki, is uh has a band called Uprooted now, but um, Rusted Root, Patrick Norman, the bass player, is a close friend of mine. I was at his wedding. We hung out for years and years. And when I started to do this thing, it this Borster Boys was my solo project. I was going to do a solo album. I was going to all my tunes, and I was just having people over. So I asked Patrick to come over and hang out. And uh, me and him hit it off writing wise. He's a smart guy. Um, very talented guy, great vocals. So I asked him to be in the band and he was in the, he was in the Borsa Boys from when we started for the first uh, three years of the band. He was in the band. The band's been together for like five years now. Um, but he was in the band for the first three. Um, we played like he got us like Devin Allman would, uh, open up for the Rusted Roots. Rusted Roots was on tour with, you said Paige and, uh, Plants. Um, so he had some connections that way as well. A funny story is uh, the, the guy who came, was coming in and he signed Rusted Root was actually going to come and check our band out. Wow. And never did and signed Rusted Root. And then on to bigger things he went and uh, we stayed right here. But uh, that that I think that that happens sometimes. Oh, it happens a lot. And, with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A&R, A&R show up with a pen in hand and a check. And uh, wait a minute. Who are these? Who are these little opening guys? <laughs> I mean, right. they were a good band and they deserved to get signed and they did really well. And that one hit did everything for them, you know, and especially being picked up on a Disney movie like that is, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I go into Giant Eagle and that song is playing all the time. So God bless them. And uh, we're I from Texas. What's that Giant? Song. What's Giant Eagle? What's Giant Eagle? <laughs> Giant Eagle is a supermarket. Uh, you oh, know. I need a T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, when you go into the supermarket, that, that song's on the radio all the time. So it's just one of those things, man. They wrote a song that's. That, What's uh, the song called? I don't, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm uh, embarrassed to say I don't know. Any on my way or something like that. On my uh, way. On my way, or semi on my way, or I think it is, or something. Hmm. Uh, but uh, it's it's it was in a Disney movie, and it's it's just it's one of those things. I wish I wrote a song like that where I it's the rest of your life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those, those Disney movies don't go away. They were a, know, they, they were a quirky uh, they were kind of a quirky band, and it was it was it was kind of unusual for a band like that to have such mainstream success because they were kind of like they were kind of like, like world. world 
yeah, world beat music or whatever. You could lump them in with like a maybe like a Dave Matthews band or something. Yeah. Uh, and it was even very, more very beat than that. It was it was very uh, tribal, very percussive, and yeah, yeah percussive, and, yes, right. And so I thought it was interesting that they got the Page Plant tour because I thought it made an interesting pair. And uh, I was there, and I saw him in Houston, and I got there early enough to see Rusted Root, and I thought to myself, man, this actually, I would have never imagined it, but this kind of makes sense. Because play, uh, Page and Plant at that time were kind of doing uh, sort of their no quarter type. They were doing variations on the Led Zeppelin song, so they weren't really true to the albums. It wasn't the, it wasn't the full-blown, full-blast, hard, electric blues of led zeppelin it was zeppelin more has that world beat thing going on yeah right? exactly they borrow from yeah. that stuff yeah oh, yeah yeah i'm not sure exactly how they got that tour i think it was the, the their um their labels or the person who helps them booking their booking agent i believe mm -hmm. they might have been on the same uh, on with the same uh, company because mm -hmm. i believe how they might have got that but i'm not positive well, more power to him because I know that uh, that exposed them to a much wider. I mean, dude, you don't get much better than uh, opening for Page and Plant in arenas because you know that's going to be a sold out tour. And I was there. I would have probably never seen Rusted Root if they weren't on that bill. That's cool that you got to work with him and, uh, you know, in any capacity and, uh, you know. Well, yeah, it was. But I mean, I didn't consider it that way because he was my friend. Yeah, he was always my friend. So yeah. it, it was just nice to actually collaborate with him and write. And, and we worked great together, uh, right. writing together. Me and him really hit it off. So uh, it it was something like he could have been out playing with Rusty Root. He was approached a bunch of times to go play with Rusty Root. He would have rather played with. He wanted to play with me. So I I, I take that as a compliment, and you know it makes me feel good that someone like that would want to play with me rather than do that you know so sure. yeah well and where where someone's head is at and where their heart is at could be two different places you know yeah, yeah. so rocky i saw one i saw a video of you i think uh wearing a, a junkyard t-shirt am i right yes i okay. love junkyard yeah. nice yeah, well, you know, we're from Austin, and uh, you know, Junkyard, David Roach, and Chris Gates are from Austin. The the genesis of Junkyard, I guess you could say, didn't start in Austin, but Roach and Gates went to L.A. and made Junkyard happen from there. Um, but yeah, we're we're big Junkyard fans, and you don't often see a Junkyard shirt in a video. Uh, so when I saw, I've, I've jumped around on in front of junkyard countless times for live shows in, in Ohio and Pittsburgh and awesome. yeah, them, faster pussycat, uh, circus of power. Awesome. So that's a whole other, you know, I went from Kansas, Boston yeah. when I was younger kids to then it was, um, circus of power, junkyard, faster pussycat. Um, that whole New York heavy riff rock, stuff really got me going as well and you're speaking our language uh, uh, again yeah. rocky yeah. you're speaking our language and i commend you sir have you yeah, kept yeah. Up with I, I watched a, show, a couple shows of you guys talking well also the bridget west show and stuff like that and i didn't realize that the bass player for faster pussycat actually played with her and things like that so i've, I've opened up for faster pussycat probably three times in the last five years because they're yeah, here I just like, i just had breakfast with here. him on a cruise ship Oh, uh, that's my buddy was on that uh, on that ship as well, Bobby oh, C, cool. my old singer in the Dirty. Who's he country. playing with? He plays with a band called Royal Honey, and, and they were on they were on the Monsters Cruise. Well, he was just there. He oh, he was just there. Him. Okay, just right on. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. So, I mean, yeah. I, I seen those guys, and I, I, I Ryan Rossi, I know him from. Uh, I, we play with them every time they're in Pittsburgh. Yeah, tell uh, us about that. I mean, not necessarily switching gears, but as soon as you you mentioned that, w w these gigs you did, you say you did with Alice Cooper. Tell us about. We have yet to talk about Paul Unger, which we should have led Paul, with that shit. But Paul, that's it right now. Paul yeah. Unger us up with. He called me. I didn't, that's the first time I ever met Paul Unger is he called me on the phone through a buddy of Steve Adams. He's like, I'm looking for a band to help. He brings in when Alice Cooper's in town. He has Alice Cooper's band, not Alice Cooper himself, but his band. They want to play a sideshow. And so we hooked it up. And the first one we did, we did a club called Moondogs. 
funny. <laughs> so we would bring all the equipment. So they used our drums, our bass, everything. All they brought was guitars to play. Um, and so we is, play out. Is this the current lineup that's that you're talking about? Is this, this Nita was, and Tommy uh, and Ryan and Glenn? Yes, and yes. yes. Uh, and uh, the Chuck. girl, her name? Um, Nita. Nita. Yeah, yeah. The whole band, the first oh, one, nice. and then in the second two after that, she didn't come to them. I don't know why oh. but she just wouldn't come to them, but the, but the whole the other band, all they were all they're they're there, um, and they use all our stuff and, and they loved us. We loved those guys. They were down to earth guys. I, oh, yeah. um, I was sitting with Ryan, me Ryan, and my guitar player Vinny were just sitting there, and, and you know we're just like, dude, I can't believe you play with Alice Cooper. You know what I mean? And he and he was like, dude, you got to understand something. He said, if I did, if I wasn't playing with Alice Cooper. I'd be doing what you're doing. And me, me and Vinny were like, wow. You know what I mean? Like, cause he, I mean, I guess he's right. You know what I mean? Oh, I would yeah. still be doing this if I didn't love it. And he just happened to jump on such a cool gig with Alice Cooper. And for him to look at us and say, Hey man, I'd be just like you. If I wasn't playing with Alice Cooper, I'd be playing bars in my hometown or, you know, well, like Rocky, the, you know, he's, yeah. he's uh Ryan's one of us. Yeah, he, I, I would, a fucking he's a fucking lifer, dude. It doesn't would, matter on what capacity, he's gonna play rock and roll if it kills him. Yeah, yeah, I would argue that anyone that would only settle for the Alice Cooper gig isn't in it for the right reasons anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. I can't if I can't be in a hot shit band, I'm gonna go home and suck my right. thumb. That doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, if you can't be in a hot shit band and you really you know love music and love playing you're gonna stay you're gonna play the corner coffee shop you know I, or else it's just sure. that's you know you're just faking it if it wasn't that way i wouldn't be 50 years old still playing rock and roll at bars you know what yeah, I mean? you're, 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 you're quite a young man so <laughs> yeah. you got your whole life ahead of you that's true that is true Yep. You're named after your band's named after a faces song. I have to ask you, and you mentioned, uh, you know, Rod Stewart. And uh, so have you ever had a chance to meet any of those guys? No, no. Be my dream. Well, they're, they're talking about doing a faces reunion, I guess, uh, this year or next year, I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking I'm about that right now, but, uh, I'd still love to see it. I'm going to see Rod. He's coming, uh, in a couple months to Pittsburgh. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I uh I work for School of Rock. I work for School of Rock and I, I, I direct shows for them. I'm an instructor as well, but and uh we're doing a British invasion show with my adult program right now and we're doing stay with me. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic so, tunes from the faces. Oh yeah. I mean what? that voice though, you know, Rod Stewart, it's one oh, of the yeah. people you just it's, you hear one word and you know it's Rod Stewart. You don't even have to hear a full word. You hear he's, one syllable and you know he's born, it. He's born to do it. That That's like its own yeah. style, just him. He could read uh, nursery rhymes and sell it books on tape. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you're a big fan because I'm a big fan too. I like everything about him. His voice, of course, first and foremost. But I've also always loved his style and his, you know, his, again, here's that word swagger. Um He's just got the whole, he's the whole package, you know? Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, Rocky, do you like the choir boys? I love the choir boys. Yeah, yeah. I knew you would. And I, and uh, oh, yeah. you, you, you did mention in a oh, conversation. Before. Yeah. You did mention in a conversation earlier, uh, Black Crows. So it's obvious. I'm going to, I'm just going to bet oh, yeah. you like the Black Crows. Too. Or satellites, you know, I mean. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's hey. my realm, all those bands that you're mentioning there for sure. Speaking yeah, you know of, what about what about country music? Do you like certain kinds of like old school country music too? It's just a question. You you can say yes or no. I mean, I I dig older country, newer country. Yeah. I'm not really that into. Um, well, that's what everybody really house says. And stuff and things like that is is sure. more the country that 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 I would listen to. Yeah, pretty is much. What happened was the guys who were writing. The metal songs in the 80s are now writing the country songs right now, the pop songs right now. So. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I'm so, guilty. I mean, it just went like that. So it, it, it took the flavor, I think, out of country for me. The, um, it's hard to write a good, like, classic, old school, like, take your dentures out before you sing country songs. There is. 
It sure yeah. is. You got to live it almost. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, it's true. When, when That's you get true. some really crazy middle eight in there with key changes and a country tune, you're you're, you're out of the realm of country to me. You know what I, I mean? I agree one hundred percent. But but the the correlation here is I feel like you know with the songs that you are writing or trying to write or you know your influences and and everything especially the stones and you know you you talk about the stones and your love for the stones they wrote some country songs that are in the realm of what we just described you know yes and i think that uh people don't realize that that you know i i, I do think that that uh you know, Ron Wood's uh, work with Rod Stewart, I feel like there's some, you know, everything sort of fits somehow when you start talking about country music and, and old honky-tonk and old lonesome cowboy, sad, you know, uh, country song kind of tearjerker type of shit, you know. And, you know, wild horses, stuff like that. I feel like the faces, I feel like that, you know, Rod could actually and did find some classic country um, mojo, whether he would admit it or not. I really feel like that's under it's an ingredient in I, that. I agree that, with you totally. Blues yeah. country all together. And Gospel. I'll it's I'm a fan from a, of Ronnie Wood as well. So yeah. to me, once he joined the Stones, that's my favorite part of the Stones when wow. Ronnie Wood entered the, and, and yeah. entered the Stones. So right. I, I have arguments with people about that all the time. Who is the better guitar player for the Stones? It's not really the better one, but the one that fit the most was Ronnie Wood. Is, is I've had countless late night arguments with people about that. <laughs> well, like, it's okay. And that's why you're on this show. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. That's why we have a show. Is that yeah, right? exactly. So it's the hard. Hard. I wanted to ask you, uh, Rocky, uh, because now, now that I know uh, the bands that you love and you mentioned the Black Crows and you mentioned Rod Stewart, have you heard of Dirty Honey? Yes, I did. They opened up for the Crows. I seen them last summer. They came through town and they're really good band. Very yes. good. Band. I saw them last night in San Antonio. I'm actually wearing a shirt that I bought at the gig and I, I never buy that. shirts at a gig. I never, never buy shirts because I can't afford the whole concert experience anymore. I can, ex I I can afford the ticket maybe, but then that's it. Uh, okay. But I had to buy a shirt because I saw that singer whose name is Mark LaBelle and oh my God, I think he is my new favorite upcoming rock singer. That guy has pipes for days days and i've heard the album and you hear the album and you you go okay that's a great singer but seeing him live last night blew my head off dude yes. he was so good rocky i love i love hearing i love hearing dave talk like this <laughs> i love hearing dave talk like this he I, goes I, to more concerts than i do so when he comes in wearing a fresh wearing fresh laundry yeah a, he must have got that at a show the night before or whatever reason that's a new shirt dave that's a new shirt tell the story tell the story and he finally did right here look samantha fish i went and seen her the other night and she was, oh yeah 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 um if you're not fans of samantha fish you should listen she's friends with uh phil sandoval i believe from uh armored what? saint I think I think he's a or he's a big fan of hers. Oh, I think okay. I've seen him post some stuff about her. But anyway, I wanted to throw in Dirty Honey because um I you know, I thought that singer just I could not believe what I was hearing, man. I mean, he's a young kid, so he's obviously got youth on his side, but if he can maintain that voice for for some length of time, he's going to have one hell of a career because he was just amazing last night. That's Mark cool. Bell. I thought so too when I seen them, and I thought the guitar player was amazing because I was like, me and my guitar player was went to the show. We're arguing. I'm like, it sounds like they have guitar tracks playing in the back because it was so full. Wow! And it wasn't, and he was just he just had it all going on, dude. He used the pedals, and and it was just it was full. The whole band, and it has that I call it riff rock, where it's sure. you know a lot of. You're, you're you're playing a lot of different notes, but it's just all riffing. You know what I mean? And and that's that's the vibe I got from that that band. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah so, well, they, they make a big deal out of uh, of not playing with any backing tracks. In fact, this whole tour with Mammoth, they were out with Eddie Van Halen's kid, Wolf yeah. Wolfgang. And the tour is billed as young the Young Guns Tour. And basically, the whole premise is it's two young rock bands that are playing all their instruments. There's no backing tracks. In fact, Wolf was even on stage last night. He had a keyboard on stage. And he even said at one point, he said, I know it sounds ridiculous that I have this keyboard out here and I only play like two notes on it, but it's because I'm so adamant about playing everything live and not using any backing tracks whatsoever. So if I got to have a keyboard up here to hit those two notes in that one song, I'm playing it live and I'm going to have a keyboard up here. (laughs) But but uh, not to, let me get, let me get something in here. Just, I, I, I'm, I love that that there's no backing tracks, but the fact that people have to nowadays have to like say, just for the record, there's no backing tracks and we're all really singing. So if you hear bad notes, then you'll know. As a matter of fact, we're going to sing a few bad notes. So you'll know that it's not backing tracks. You know, the fact that someone has to say that that shit, you know, that doesn't mean that they don't have a pitch corrector on their vocals. So <laughs> just because there's no backing tracks doesn't mean that they ain't using a little processing gear to make sure that they're in uh, in tune. So I mean, there's a little. I, I, I would let, I would maybe let them get away with that, but <laughs> but uh, for the most part, yeah, it's like if a sound man or somebody says, you know, what do you want on your vocals, and it's not a sound man that knows me already and knows what okay. to do. It's like, what do you mean, what do I want on my vote? Well, do you need some pitch correction? Do you need some delay? I'm like, I don't need shit. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's real right there. So, <laughs> the uh, you know, there's two things that I want to cover before we go, Rocky. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll sum it up with Paul Unger. So, don't let me forget Paul Unger because you, I know you wouldn't let me forget Paul. No, no, no. You you mentioned in our conversation earlier that you're starting like your own version of uh of a music network. Please tell us about that and how you, how that is obviously going to be a giant player in in just saving music and saving live music and saving songwriters and saving the business part of it and saving um just tell us about your idea and what your plan is and I believe that you're 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 going to do it in your own studio. Tell us all about it. Everything you can. So it's going to be called music from the 412. Uh, that's the area code for Pittsburgh is 412. Okay. So it. music from the 412. And what I wanted to do was start a video station. It's not like I'm inventing this idea. It was MTV I had the idea first a long time ago before they stopped playing music. I want to do that locally and I want to play local bands videos. I also want to have shows like I'm going to have a show that I'm doing that's called Rocky's Rock and Roll Symphony. And it's like a late, it's set up like a late night show where I have a live band. I have an acoustic act. I also interview either like a, a sound man, uh, a production crew guy or someone who's uh, an artist and bring and show their art pieces or whatever on the show and interview all these people. So I want to create a station where you go to just put on and you can watch music and maybe be turned on to some music that you not that you might not normally be turned on to because in society today everybody goes to youtube and grabs what they want to watch when they want to watch it it, I just thought it would be nice that if there was a station in pittsburgh and it's not even pittsburgh because it's going to be streamed that anybody can go to and just turn on when they get home from work and there's just nothing but unsigned bands videos one after another that they didn't pull up themselves that they might actually be like wow that's a cool band there and it might help the whole music scene because more people would start to pay attention i would is what i'm hoping that more people sure. start to pay attention that like wow i never heard of this band before i never heard of that one instead of the mentality of just putting on what you want to see so yeah. that's what i'm trying to start is that some some sense of discovery. Yes. Yeah, I just can't call it the Discovery Channel. <laughs> right? Uh, but you but you could you could call it, you know, so so just this is kind of just a fun term, but Rocky's playlist, right? You're putting together something for um someone else to discover as opposed to just kind of 
creating their own playlist, you're you're trying to turn the world on to something fresh that they may not have heard before. That's fantastic. I think that that's uh you know more there there should be more. We have a we have a five one two uh a t, a t, it's on a local channel. I think it's on like the CW or something. That's basically a a local cable channel, if you will. Uh, yeah. here in uh, 512 area code in Austin, Texas. And that's what it is. And these bands go into a recording studio and they play their set live, but it's recorded at the recording studio. And yeah. a friend of ours, uh, Omar Vallejo, runs this show. He's the MC. he introduces the bands, he sells ad space, yada, yada, yada. And it's all local vendors who, are, who buy ad space. And um, it comes on at a certain time, but every every show is a band, and they interview the band, and the band actually plays live, yes. but the show's not live. So he gets to mix the live tracks, right? And, and, if they, and if they mess it up, they get to re-record -re the same song. You know, oh, it's out of tune. They just do it again. So it's similar to it's, you know, it's fixed in post only by setup for the ad space, right? Yes. And then it's run at a certain time, and uh, that's a that's something that needs to happen more often. So I'm really happy that that you're doing something. Is, like is that. it up and running, Rocky? I missed that. Is it is no. it happening already? Creation isn't happening, but you can go to the website right now because I'm I'm putting all this together. So this isn't just for Pittsburgh bands as well. So if it's someone from around your town or whatever, if they want me to play their music. I'll gladly play it. All they got to do is go on the music from the 412.com and there's a submission forms. Okay. And so all they got to do is send me their, their, their video file. And they say that they wrote the song and they're giving me permission to use it, that they own the video rights to the song and they give me permission to use it. And I'll gladly play it. I'd like to, it's not, it's going to be mainly Pittsburgh, but Definitely some bands from Ohio, wherever, any bands, if they want to be on this thing and they have a professionally done video and it sounds good, I, I would definitely play it. You know what I mean? All kind of music. I want to get people exposed to all kind of music. I want to try to help music in general. I, I know it's kind of weird to say that because there's all kind of people out there already doing that, but it, it's just my idea that I think that we need a music station out there for unsigned bands, especially in Pittsburgh, to even the sign bands that are in Pittsburgh, that that people actually get different kinds of music and hear bands that they don't normally do. There's bands in this town that I don't even know who they are. Like now that, I, that people know that I'm I'm doing this, I'm getting I'm getting people sending me their stuff, and I didn't even know they existed. So it's cool that if then I'll put it out there, and people who didn't know they existed now will hopefully and that's right. kind of the point or the what i'm trying to achieve with it you know yeah yeah no that's i i applaud that that's awesome i just I wanted to it, make sure that if it was up and running people were aware of it and how to find it and and it sounds like it's not but there is a website that they can go to and check out and possibly what's, even the, what's the website again it's uh www.musicfromthe412.com nice. yeah. go on there there's going to be six shows. When we start this year, there's going to be six different shows. I have my own. There's a guy on there going to be one doing one called the rock collector. And he's going around talking to local musicians in Pittsburgh with their collections. So like if someone collects hubcaps, he's going to go into the room where he has all the hubcaps and that's where he'll do his interview with the guy talking about music and things like that. And also his collection. So we have other people doing different shows. We have one called 666 degrees of, of metal, and that's going to be an all metal show. So I love that. that's hilarious. Different. So we're trying to start like a, like you said, a, um, like a, a TV station, that's a local a cable access kind of station or whatever, but it's going to be streamed. So it's going these to be are, on that website. These are really, um, respectable titles of, of ideas of sort of little different hubs, you know, that you would have under your umbrella in your, in your sort of network thing. And I think that more, um, music scenes, plural should have something like this. I know for a fact that just right here at home in Austin, Texas, and this area, there is there are so many musicians and writers and bands and artists and i i don't know who they are i guarantee if someone like 
said, you should watch this. I'll give you five bucks to watch this. I guarantee that a nine out of 10, I'll go, holy shit, I love that. Where can I buy the record? Where can I see them play? We've well, tried doing that with this podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll give you five bucks to watch this. Yeah. <laughs> We're still waiting for the money to roll in. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> I'm not really concerned about the money. I'm doing it really, I really am doing it to, to try to help out the scene here in Pittsburgh. When you talk about Austin and when you talk about Memphis and Nashville and stuff like that, those guys have a really cool scene. They've worked over a lot of years and stuff. And what happens is a lot of Pittsburgh musicians, they end up going to those places. Those places are destinations for other musicians from around the country that they're good enough and they go to those places when it should be good enough here you know sometimes they got you got to think and, and some of them come back and i've been to some of these places as well and not that they're not great musicians but we have just the quality of the musician here in pittsburgh is is amazing yeah but we have it here as well and i'm just trying to turn it on and, and and through the internet you can turn it on to the world you know and uh sure. yeah. I, that, i'm kind of trying to do that so wish yeah. me luck well, i <laughs> There's a, you got it. You got all the luck in the world uh, yeah, from yeah. us. Uh, we're we're immediate fans of of everything that you have going on. So there's a guy, um, Dave Pruitt, in our area who, for like, I'll I'll just say thirty fucking years at least, uh, he would uh, he had a public access show, a couple of different ones, but he had one called Raw Time that was all local music i believe and he has now he's just online to fast forward dave tv.com or dot org i can't recall at the moment but he's been doing it so long um it's like you could see the different faces of dave pruitt you know but this guy is such a music supporter he's like another front row joe which is what i used to call metal dave here all the time <laughs> front row he, you know the singer would always hand him the microphone you know yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that he's front row joe you're that's that's metal dave a little bit. anyway dave tv would be the guy with the camera and he'd bring his buddy who's drinking a beer hold this camera it's pointing at the singer all night you know and then he'd edit it together and put it so he would have he would stay up all night long live taking calls playing local music uh <laughs> His his for archives years. are insane. For, his for, archives for, are insane. I mean, he's got years. he's got club footage of you know Stevie Ray Vaughan and the fabulous Thunderbirds and you know Dangerous but, Toys back before you know they were signed and all. He's got studio. He's got stu in studio interviews with like people like Bill Hicks and Iggy Pop and yeah, you know <laughs> it's crazy. crazy. Uh, yeah. me, he, Mia amazing. Jovovich, Mia Jovovich came through Austin and did yeah. an in store at an old old at a Tower Records, I think it was, and he, he's interviewing her, Mia fucking Jovovich. So yeah. that'll give you an idea. So I I see that you are uh, uh, cut from the same cloth as folk like that who are in the trenches and um, really just care about the song. Uh, and turning the song on to people who need to hear it. I appreciate that. It's it, it's gonna. We'll we'll see what happens. It, I, it it's taken me a year to get this far with it. Yeah. Uh, the next step is going to be after we get up and start broadcasting, and uh, I think it's going to go over well. And I, I'm just trying to do something to help the whole music community out. You know, and, and this is something separate from my, my from my band and things like that. So I'm also putting on shows with music from the 412. Um, we're going to do some uh, live streaming shows from a big club here in, in town. So you, that that website, if you go to that, all that will be on it. All the shows that we're doing, there'll be uh, live web broadcast shows that are going to be on that as well. And then the station hopefully is going to be up by September, October. Cool. Well, um, we can mention it in our show description for your episode on Talk Louder. We can mention that website. That's where right. where can people buy uh, merchandise or any Borstal Boys? Are you on all of the streaming platforms? Yes, on all, all the streaming platforms, iTunes, Spotify, all of it. Great, Borstal Boys, right? Yes, yeah. yes Borstal yeah. Boys, and uh, you can go to borstalboys.com. Fantastic. 
All right. Jason, you wanted to close with Paul Unger. You want to hit How that? How do you know? Quick? It's a very simple question. How do you know Paul Unger? Well, we went over it a little bit earlier. It was because yeah. uh, he was looking for a band to, to open up for the Alice Cooper's Alice Cooper's band he, when he came through he, town. So he cold called you and yes, and now he's a, now he understands the Rocky Lamondi story. He likes me a lot. He does a lot to help me. Um, I also worked on Bridget West's her last thing that she just put out that the COVID tapes and what it was. And uh, Paul called me up and he's like, "Hey man, I want to put this out." And he says she did some, these songs. Those are all recorded on her phone. Yeah, she mm -hmm. put her phone in front of her like an iPhone and recorded herself playing guitar. And I just mastered it for him. You know, wow. so I you know I I got this got the sound as good as I could because it's just a phone recording. Sure. It's not like I could separate the guitar from the vocals or anything like that. Um, so I did that for him as well. And me and him have worked on, on other stuff. He's gotten me interviews and stuff. I help him out doing some things that he's done. You know, um, I always try to push his stuff like the Bridget West stuff or Ryan Roxy stuff, you know, just, just collaborating with people and talking with people and pushing what everybody's trying to push is what I try to do with, you know, like I'm a guy on Facebook that is, I, I share all the other bands like I, in the daytime, yeah. I'll probably share four other bands gigs at night or whatever what, during the day. I just yeah. think if people help each other out more, that it, it, it would be better for everybody. You know, and yeah. Paul yeah. is in the same mindset for sure. Yeah. yeah. Paul is, uh, Paul is, if much like metal Dave here, if you're a band or an artist and Paul Unger is a fan of your shit you yeah. are a rich man your yeah. band is rich if you have if one of your fan one of your fans is a paul unger or a metal dave here because they're gonna wear, put on the t-shirt they're gonna go out and wave the flag for you they're gonna talk about you on their websites they're gonna like push your stuff they're gonna share your videos they're gonna do it all that's like paul unger is a one man army of a street team kind of a thing i wouldn't have met you two guys today or be speaking with you without without paul because he's the one to set it up bingo Same. yeah exactly Yeah, bingo so exactly. so paul unger is um uh, you know he's friends with uh he's uh, old friends i should use the word old like i, I use it like uh <laughs> i do hello these days but he um he's been a fan of my stuff since you know the 80s yes. and he uh has been golden he spent time in texas um and i believe he's from ohio uh he yes. yeah and he was he's uh he's friends with the old friend old buddies with our producer jared because he was a pariah fan and um i don't know if you know too much history of paul unger he had a uh, like a sort of a, a, a public a, a publicity agency kind of a thing called like Noisy Fans of America. He had a fanzine. Uh, are you familiar with that? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. So too, he wanna, he's going to do a a podcast. Uh, noisy fans. The same same thing. Perfect. Uh, he's doing that. That's coming up because he got hooked up with. The person who I told you that's doing the Rock Collector show on the thing, okay. they have a radio station here in town, and he's going to be the out, out on the town guy for that. So he's stepping into that, which is good good for Paul because it's perfect for him. Yeah. Well, I think he mentioned that to me. I just didn't know how to set it up right that that's what it was he that he yeah. was kind of doing. So I knew that he's he's cooking up some more stuff. Yes, he is. At Paul Unger. He's been cooking up stuff for rock and roll for a long time. You're and, right, though. If he likes you, he goes out of his way. He calls me up all the time. He's like, Rock, and he gets me an interview with, with this person, that person, whatever. It, it, he's always trying to help, which is yeah. amazing. You know? Well, I think, you know, speaking for myself, it's just uh, – it's just an extension of your passion for music. Like speaking for myself, it's like yeah, if I, I find say, that's something, your cue. That's your cue, Dave, because I've heard you. Yeah, you know where if I find something you. that I like, um, as much as I want it to be my own personal treasure, 
Um, I get so excited about it if it's really good, just like you heard me raving about Dirty Honey earlier. Now that's a, you know, now they're a national act, but I do the same thing for local punk rock garage bands here in Austin, Texas. If it excites me, I want it to excite you. And however long I got to talk to make it excite you, I'm going to (laughs) talk and I'm going to wear the shirt and I'm going to drag you to the gig and I'm going to, I'm just going to talk until you can't stand it anymore. And I'm going to try my best to make you a believer. Which is, which is why we have a podcast. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Because we get in the same. So Rocky, I don't know if you know that historically, uh, we just recently celebrated our one year anniversary of, uh, of the Talk Louder podcast. Yay. So we have about, I don't know, 80 episodes in. Um, The idea was, you know, our producer, Jared, who's uh, one of my songwriting partners, calls us both up one day and says, what do you, what do you guys think about both of us? You know, I'm just trying to make the story short. What do you guys think about doing a podcast? And we're like, what? He said, like, yeah, when you guys get in the room, the rest of the room either disappears because they're bored to tears, that rhymes, or <laughs> they, they're just huddled around you listening to the story like you guys are the campfire. Not yeah. that it's people around a campfire. You guys are the fire because you guys won't shut up because you read the fine print on all the Kiss albums or whatever. You know? yeah, yeah, that's what I said to you when, when I was talking to you earlier. I you can tell that because you know all you know all those interesting details and stuff like that, and that, that's why it's great what you guys do with the podcast. That's what podcasts are, are really good because you know you get information that you normally wouldn't. You know, you're talking yeah. to somebody and they know the song or something like that or the riff. They don't know who produced it. They don't know oh he played this Les Paul on it or he played a Telly on it instead. Like those are like the fine details that people who really search for those things it's and very rare it's very rare that that dave or i use we're guilty of course but that we use wikipedia <laughs> because of what you said yeah it's it's and, most of it's up here uh you know algebra no room for that uh right. you know? <laughs> but it, who played the solo on sweet pain on destroyer we know that <laughs> yeah so, and, yeah and who who produced iron maiden's killers or whatever you know we know yeah. all that nerdy stuff so so speaking of a word that that dave just used i got two more words for you and the reason we have a podcast and the reason that you're even here is nerd alert it's kind of important to know that the people who are not outside in the sunshine are the people listening to their record collections all summer long with no tan (laughs) and and no friends other than rock and roll so and and on and on that note we're gonna we're gonna send rocky home with some homework here uh, because he's such a Boston fan, and now now he did say that Tom Scholz played all the bass lines on the Boston stuff. But I mentioned that the guy who's credited on the albums, I want to say his name is Barry Goudreau. Okay. And you get back to me and let me know, Rocky, if I'm right, because we're this is this is a nerd contest right here. Okay, <laughs> I, I will. Someone told me on that post that. He got credit for it, but he only played on one or two tracks. Is what I heard. Ah, that okay. may be true, but I know I his picture. I, I may have the name wrong, but I know there's a guy pictured on the, you know, and obviously they had a live bass player, and he's pictured on the album covers. And I want to say his name is Barry Goudreau, but because we were also talking about the album cover where it looks like spaceships, but it's yeah. actually a guitar that's upside down. Mm-hmm. But if you look at that picture closely, it's not a guitar. There's only four tuning pegs and there's only four strings. So it's, it looks like an ovation guitar, but it only has four strings on it, there which is probably because of those bass lines were so good. <laughs> <laughs> there you I like go. That. I like There's that a tie spin. in. Yeah. I, like spin I love on it. it. I love it. <laughs> hey, Rocky, how, how did you, how did you get hooked on rock and roll? What was the first record? What was the first song when you, were, when you were a kid? Kiss. Yeah. I think what was what album was it? Was it Alive 2 where Gene Simmons had all the blood on his face? On the yeah, back? Alive 2. Yeah. yeah that. But when I was eight years old and I seen that and I was just like, yes. <laughs> I, wonder what, I wonder what it is in your, in your pre-teens that when you see a grown man wearing clown makeup with blood all over his face makes you giddy. I wonder yeah. what it is because 
Beach it's the same thing for me. Intro to that, where it's the, they're in the car, the car starts up, and like that. Kiss was what really was the first band that really got me into music for sure. Yeah, yeah, gateway yeah. band. Yes, yeah, sure. absolutely. Yeah. Same here. Yeah, same yeah. here. I Kiss mean, it was, I, it was Elton John, and then Queen, and then you know. So I was into stuff that was a little bit pre Kiss, and it so it took me a second, you know, but. By like 19, by the time I was like, you know, nine or 10 years old, Kiss was all over my walls. Yep. Yeah. Changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think that, I think that band has had that effect on many, 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 many people. So it's very true. Me. How do I, uh, in the future, get in touch with you guys? Um, Paul you can, Unger. Paul Unger. <laughs> yep. <yeah>, Paul <laughs> Unger has it all. That's fine. <laughs> Today I was, or yesterday I was like, Paul, send me that link again. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you something, man. I never even like heard the name to you, Jason. Like when you were like twenty years old, and he sent it me. It was like my phone was like ding, 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 ding. I never heard the name Paul Unger until about a month ago, and now I feel like I know him because he sent uh, he sent some guest our way. Uh, you, Bridget, uh, Ryan Roxy, Jason speaks highly of him. And I feel like he's uh, one of my long lost friends, even though I've never met him and didn't even know his name until about a month he's, ago. He's, see this? Yes, I do. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, hold on. That's Jared next to Paul. That's our producer with this holding the strap. That's wow. our producer. That's Jared. <laughs> He just I have all pariah, all this stuff. Yeah, that's that's our producer holding that's the guitar, standing next to Paul. Oh, he is there. Yeah, that's Sims. Yep. Yep. Wow. Yeah, that's heavy. Yeah, well, Paul's a good dude, man. He's he's done nothing but help me out with my band and everything like that. And uh, you know, I didn't even have to ask him to do it. He just goes out of his way. He he was really happy that. Those guys in Cooper's band loved all the equipment that we brought. You know what I mean? They loved our drum yeah. set and, and all the amps. And the funny, I didn't say the story or the thing, but the funny thing was we all used like Fender basements. Like our, my guitar player used a Fender basement. Yeah, okay. And so we borrowed like some Marshalls just because, and they didn't use our basements or our, or our Mesa Boogie amps. They, they wanted the Marshalls, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they just wanted that loud answer or whatever. So we had some funny conversations about that. I'll tell you one funny one was the first one we did with Cooper were at this bar of moon dogs. It's all my equipment and we're hanging out in this back room and Paul comes in all flustered. <laughs> He's like, watch this equipment. Make sure no one steals anything. And I didn't even know him at the time. I'm like, motherfucker, it's all my equipment. What am I going to steal? You know what I mean? It, it was the funniest thing. And once I told him that he was like, Oh yeah, it is all your equipment. <laughs> but it, you know, it, it, the way I met him, it was cool. I took care. I made sure that I did everything right for Alice Cooper's band, and had, they they were taken care of and stuff. And he really appreciated. So he's always done the same for me since then. You know, that's really the story of me and him. Nice, awesome. Yeah, that's just instincts kicking in. Don't let anybody steal this shit. Oh, it's yours. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what are you talking about, man? It's all my shit. <laughs> well, he, you know, he must have he must have seen what some shady characters looming around or something at a rock and, show. And it was just, right, but it was just you standing there. So it's like, does did he think that you were the looming that you were the shady character looming? No, it was like a bunch of us. We were all in this back room, and he thought this back room was just like for them to put their stuff down and no one really to be in. Oh, and it was okay. a bunch of us right. back there smoking weed. And, and he came back right. and he's like, what's, what's, who's watching this gear? And I'm like, I don't know, man. You know, he, it, it was just a weird thing. Like he thought like he was just flustered in his head. And once yeah, he yeah, said yeah. that to me, I was like, dude, I know I was going to steal anything here. Relax. <laughs> but it's just a funny story. I think he was just doing like stage manager mode, you know? Yes, yes, yes. He was, it, and now that I know he's on high alert like that, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's no, it's going to happen. I was, yeah. I was uh, recently in uh, Sealands Grove, Pennsylvania, doing a gig, and he was front row, just right in my face, for two hours. 
Yeah. And so it was cool to see him again. And it, it had been quite a while, but I recently got to hang out with him a little bit. So it was good seeing him. If you can hear my bands in there, they just showed up. Yeah, that's cool. We're, we got to go yeah. and do your intro. We're going to kick you out of the room so we can talk shit about you now. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it, man. Hey, yeah, Rocky, yeah. it was awesome hanging out with you today, man. We really appreciate all of the fine work that you're doing and uh, you. and the fact that you are writing songs from the heart and performing live and trying to help your scene. Yeah, and pushing yeah. your scene. Yeah, yeah. your yeah. scene and, and you beyond. Too. Yeah, man. Thanks for joining us today, Rocky. We really appreciate it. On right, behalf guys. of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave, along with our special guest, Rocky, from the Borstol Boys today. Thank you all for listening to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. Talk Louder.